Just the lateness of your president and treasurer, I'm afraid we had another meeting and didn't quite get back as quickly as we'd hoped. So welcome to members and their guests for this evening's lecture, Sir John Pender, CM, GCMG 1816-1896, The Cable King by Stuart Ash. Um, Stuart spent his entire career in the submarine cable industry, first with ST. Sea submarine systems moving to cable, cable and wireless, and then to global marine systems before becoming an independent consultant in 2005. His interest in the history of this industry was sparked in 2000 when the project managed a celebration of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the industry. Since then, he has written and lectured extensively on this subject, and over the past 18 years, thanks to the generosity of the Pender Factory family, has developed a unique knowledge of the man that he's here to talk about tonight. Thank you, Stuart. I don't think this microphone's on. Do we know how? Oh, that one. On the lights? Yes, should be OK now. Is that working? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be asked to talk to you today about the life of Sir John Fender. Over the next 60 minutes or so, I hope to give you some insight into the business, family, and political life of a man who came from humble beginnings to become one of the most influential businessmen of the Victorian era, but who is largely unrecognised today. In our modern world, we have almost instant access to a wealth of information through our laptops, mobile phones, personal computers, and tablets. Very few of us know or even care how this is possible. Like all utilities, we just expect it to be there and complain when it isn't. Access to the World Wide Web is only possible thanks to a vast global network of fibre optic cables. These cables are the arteries of the internet, enabling e-commerce and shaping social media. Therefore, submarine cables are arguably the most important technology in modern society. However, this industry did not spring up overnight. It was over 160 years in the making. In terms of a single contribution to this great enterprise, one man stood head and shoulders above all the rest, and that man was John Pender. John Pender was a Scotsman who came from a working class background. His parents came from the Vale of Leibniz and married in Campsie in Eastern Bodinshire in 1807. His mother was the daughter of a cattle dealer. However, his father's lineage is far less certain, but he was probably the natural child of a cloth bleacher. James Pender appears to have been an educated man who took up a, a clerical or management role in the bleaching and calico printing works of Weefield in the village of Bon Hill. This company was established by Gilbert Lang in 1793. The Pender family are most likely to have lived in Burn Street, and there they had eight children. Their eldest son, James, never married, and from 1837 he worked for his father's newly formed company, James Pender & Co. Calico Printers. He died in Port-au-Prince on the 4th of January, 1841. John was the middle of seven surviving children, and the marriages made by his sisters would suggest a significant rise in the family's affluence and social status through the 1830s and 1840s. Gilbert Lang sold the Bon Hill Print Works in 1824, and this may have been the reason why the Penders moved from Bon Hill to Glasgow. Between 1793 and 1836, the Gorbals was an upmarket residential area to the southwest of the city, and the Penders moved there at the peak of its popularity. In school, John excelled at bookkeeping, maths, and drawing for which he won a gold medal for original design. This must have been an outstanding piece of work as it was still on display there in the school in 1889. 
It has never been established precisely where John served his apprenticeship, but there is strong circumstantial evidence to suggest that it was at the Crofton Geo factory in Bon Hill. In, the 18th, in 1830, this factory was operated by Turnbull and Jones. Little is known about John's apprenticeship years, but they appear to have been split into two distinct phases. Until 1835, he concentrated on developing his pattern-making skills, and it is said that he visited Paris on several occasions where he studied the production of cottons and cambrics in the Paris factories. However, in 1835, John O. Ewing and his partner Robert Alexander acquired Crofton Gia, and from then on, John Pender's career path changed. He was groomed for a role in management, and in 1837, he took control of the factory. John's first wife was the daughter of a Glasgow merchant tailor. The couple, mar couple was soon blessed with a son, but it appears that Marion suffered complications with James's birth, because just three months later, she died on her 22nd birthday. The death of his wife and elder brother affected John profoundly. He threw himself into his work, selling the company's products to Manchester, which was the centre of the growing export trade to China and India. In the process, he made Alexander and Orr Ewing very rich men. When in 1843, Orr Ewing decided to sell up and retire, John left the company to move south and set up his own business. He took up residence in Grove House in Higher Broughton with his two-year-old son and his younger sister Elizabeth as his housekeeper. Grove House is no longer there. The site at 282 Berry New Road is now part of Tom Horton's tea and coffee shop. Pender's capital was limited and he could only afford a small office at 20 David Street, which was in the industrial part of the city. In addition to his export business, he traded the base material called grey cloth between the manufacturers, bleachers and printers, earning commissions on each of these transactions. At that time, this middleman role was an unusual and niche market in which Pender made a lot of money very quickly. As his business grew in 1846, he was able to move to bigger offices in the business centre of Manchester. This is now a Great Two listed building. Four years later, he moved to a much larger residence and took up a lease on Bradbury Hall near Stockpool. The original Bradbury Hall was demolished in the mid 20th century and has been replaced by a hotel bearing the same name. After a decade as a widower, John remarried. Emma Dennison was the eldest daughter of Henry Dennison, a Liverpool lawyer, and Anne Goulding. Her father was the younger son of Robert Dennison, owner of the Daybrook Estate near Arnold in Northamptonshire, sorry, in Nottinghamshire, and very much landed gentry. Emma was the same age as John and was an heiress to a significant fortune. However, most of it was tied up in Chancery, and perhaps because of this, she was unmarried at the age of 34. To be a spinster at her age was, sorry, excuse me. To be a spinster at her age would have been a social disgrace, especially as her younger sister Mary had already married. Emma's status in Victorian society would have been seen as higher than that of John Bender. As far as Emma's mother was concerned, he was trade and far below them, and consequently she never forgave Emma for marrying him. However, it turned out to be a long, happy and successful partnership. There were four children from the union, and the first three were born at Bradbury Hall. Henry never married. He died at Footscray Place on the 19th of January 1881, having contracted typhoid fever while travelling in Italy with his father. He was just 28. 
Anne had a congenital heart defect and was probably somewhere on the autistic spectrum. She never married and died at her brother's London house, six Grosvenor Crescent, on the 18th of April, 1902. She was aged 49. John married Beatrice Kathleen Anderson in 1879 and they had two sons. He would eventually replace his father at the head of their business empire. He died at his London residence and was buried in Sloan in Sussex on the 6th of March, 1929, aged 73. Due to their increased combined wealth, Emma and John were able to give up their lease on Brebury Hall and purchase the larger Crumsall House estate. This house no longer exists, as it was demolished in 1934 to make way for an estate of terraced houses. At the age of 17, Marion married George William DeVoe, a career diplomat, and 22 years her senior. She gave birth to seven children, three of whom did not survive into infancy. She outlived her husband and two surviving sons, and died at her London home, 51 Eaton Square, on the 15th of July, 1955. She was 98. At the time of his second marriage, John Pender's wealth was almost entirely dependent on his textile export business, which during the 1850s continued to grow rapidly. In 1850, his father had retired and his business was then absorbed, becoming the Glasgow offices of John's company. Cotton production reached its peak in 1858, leading to an oversupply of great wealth and finished goods. The situation was exacerbated by speculators stockpiling raw cotton in warehouses at the port of entry. The Lancashire cotton industry was entirely, almost entirely reliant on cotton from the southern states of America, and the supply dried up completely due to blockades of Confederate forts by the Unionists. Almost overnight, the Manchester cotton workers went from being the best paid in the country to poverty and starvation. Pender was one of several Manchester merchants who lobbied the government to increase cotton production in India to compensate for the loss of American supplies. To push the case further, they needed a voice in the House of Commons. So Pender stood and was elected as a Liberal MP for Totnes in a by-election on the 12th of December, 1862. From his youth in Bon Hill, he was painfully aware of and sympathetic to the plight of the working man and unlike many others, he kept all his staff employed throughout the famine. In November 1862, he opened this dining room to provide cheap food for the working men of Manchester. In the first month, 50,000 men were served, and in a ceremony on the 31st of January 1863, the Mayor of Manchester presented Sir John Pender, sorry, John Pender MP, with an illuminated testimonial signed by 2,200 people. Cook and Wheatstone's company was incorporated in 1845, and for six years it enjoyed a virtual monopoly over telegraph traffic in the UK. Its first real competitor was formed in Liverpool in 1851. In 1852, the Magnetic needed new capital to lay a cable across the Irish Sea, and so the company was reformed to invite additional investment. Since their marriage, Emma had encouraged John to diversify his investment portfolio, and so she recommended to him that this company represented a good opportunity. John was not as convinced, but trusting his wife's judgment, as we all do, he made a large stock purchase. As was his practice, he looked deeply into the company's affairs and followed closely the installation of the RSC cable. It was this project that triggered his lifelong commitment to submarine cables. In 1857, John Pender was instrumental in this merger and he became the company's first chairman. 
It would provide the vital link between London and the west coast of Ireland for the Atlantic Telegraph. Now I'm sure most of you have heard the story of the Atlantic Telegraph many times before, so I'll quickly highlight some of the key milestones that relate to John Pender's contribution to this world-changing project. After 12 long years, the project was finally completed and two Atlantic cables went into service. In recognition of this great achievement, Queen Victoria awarded decorations to six leading members of the project. When Queen Victoria's Honours List was made public, the following awards were granted to Atlantic Telegraph projectors. Lamson was originally an American from New Haven, Vermont, but had become a British citizen in 1849. He joined the board of the Atlantic Telegraph Company in 1856 and was then its deputy chairman, as well as being on the board of the Anglo-American Telegraph Company. Gooch was chairman of the Great Eastern Shipping Company and a, and a director of Telcon. Anderson was the captain of the Great Eastern. Tomans, later Lord Kelvin, was the chief scientist of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. Atwood Glass was chairman of the Anglo-American Telegraph Company and managing director of Telcon. Canning was the chief engineer of Telcon. Field had been the driving force behind the project from the beginning, and his contribution was recognised, but as an American citizen, who was ineligible for a British decoration. John Pender, the man who had done more than any other to make the Atlantic Telegraph a success, was not recognised in any way. So let's have a look at John Pender's contribution. When Brett and Bright with Field came to Manchester to raise capital, John Pender was the first to invest £1,000 and he encouraged other Manchester men to invest too, helping greatly to raise the required £350,000. For this he was invited to join the board of directors. However, he did not take an active role in the 1857 and 1858 attempts. After the 1858 failure, he resigned his directorship to concentrate on his textile business, the cotton famine, and his wife's declining health. As already mentioned, he was the first chairman of this company, a position he held until it was nationalised and became part of the General Post Office in 1870. After John Watkins Brett's death, Field served to Pender to take the lead with the British investors and invited him to rejoin the board where he remained until it merged with the Anglo-American in 1873. It was Pender who took on the task of merging the Gutter Percha Company and Glass Elliott Co. to form the company known as Telcon. To convince the director of these two companies, he put up a personal guarantee of £250,000. He became the first chairman until he stood down and was replaced by Daniel Gooch in 1868. It was Pender and Thomas Brassey who assisted Gooch with the purchase of the Great Eastern, the setting up of the company and the conversion of the ship for cable work. He was a company director until the ship was decommissioned in 1878. It was also Pender who personally approached Cunard and secured the services of James Anderson as the ship's captain. When after the 1865 failure, the Atlantic Telegraph Company was unable to raise new capital, it was Pender and Gooch who raised 650,000 to launch this company and complete the project. Both invested 10,000 pounds and became directors. When Apple Glass retired due to ill health in March 1867, John Pender replaced him as chairman, a position he held until his death. Despite this pivotal role in the ultimate success of the Atlantic Telegraph, he received no royal recognition. So why should this have been the case? Some historians have suggested that it was because England had a Conservative government at that time 
and all the decorated men were conservatives, whereas Pender was a liberal. There may be some truth in this, but it's not the main reason. For that, we have to go back to Totnes. This election was called by Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, at which the Liberals increased their majority to 79 seats. In 1865, Totnes, like many other boroughs, returned two MPs to Westminster. These petitions alleged corrupt practices during the election campaigns. However, most of the petitions were lodged by losing Conservative candidates, so the government was able to resist pressure to investigate. However, under Russell, the government became divided on the subject of parliamentary reform, and they finally agreed to look into the accusations. The Totnes Committee heard evidence from Thomas Harris, a Totnes blacksmith, and a Conservative agent, who alleged that Pender had offered him a job worth £300 per annum for his vote. Surprisingly, Bovary denied Pender the opportunity to give evidence to the committee and, def and defend himself against this accusation. He then named Pender in his report to the House on the 1st of May 1866, declaring him guilty of bribery. This made, was made public by the Times the following day. In response, John Pender wrote a letter to the editor of the Times in which he vehemently protested his innocence and it was published a few days later. Although the decisions taken by the Select Committee were not published in Hansard until the 22nd of December 1866, and Robert Harris was later shown to be a convicted perjurer, solely on his evidence, John Pender had been publicly condemned. Surprisingly, the election of Alfred Seymour, the other Totnes MP, was upheld. The Royal Commission considered Great Yarmouth, Lancaster, Reigate and Totnes, and its report was published on the 27th of January 1867. It exonerated John Pender of the charge of bribery, but found him guilty, like all the other candidates, of being aware of and condoning the corrupt practices that were endemic in these boroughs. At the time the honours list was issued, the public record showed that John Pender was guilty of bribery. Therefore, it would have been impossible for the Queen to acknowledge him and his role in the Atlantic Telegraph. So why had Bovary singled Pender out in this way? It appears that on several occasions, Bovary had crossed swords with, in business with Pender and he had come off the worst on each of these encounters. There is little doubt that Bovary used the position as chairman of the Select Committee to settle some old scores. Because of the acrimony that developed between Pender and William Gladstone, it would be more than 20 years before the establishment finally recognised John Pender's contribution to the Empire through submarine telegraphy. In February 1868, on medical advice, Lord Dolby stood down as Prime Minister and was replaced by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Benjamin Disraeli. This was one of the first pieces of legislation that he tabled. It enabled the post office to buy out all the private terrestrial telegraph companies and, and run them themselves. While the bill was still in committee stage, Pender resigned as chairman and sold off all his shares in the company before they could be compulsively purchased. He also stood down as chairman of Telcon in favour of Daniel Gooch, who retained his stock holding in the company. He then set about building a cable to India. The company was initially chaired by Lord William Hay and was the start of what would become the global network operated by the Eastern and Associated Telegraph Companies. Pender's approach to establishing was Sorry, Pender's approach was, was to establish limited companies for each section of the route in order to mitigate the financial exposures. The Anglo-American controlled the route, sorry, the Anglo-Mediterranean controlled the route from the French border 
to Suez via Turin, Sicily, Malta and Alexandria, with monopoly control over the route across Egypt. This was an excellent time to be in control of the telegraph traffic between Egypt and Paris, as the Suez Canal was in its final stages of con construction. British India installed the cable from Suez to Aden and on to Bombay. It was the first cable operating company of which John Pender was the founding chairman. John Pender became frustrated that he could not negotiate an agreement with the French government for operating rights over the terrestrial, their terrestrial telegraph. So in June 1869, he registered this company. It built and operated a cable from Malta to Cornwall, via Gibraltar and Lisbon. The original landing site in the UK was meant to be Falmouth, but it was moved to Porthcurno due to concerns over damage to the cable by ships and coves because of the high volume of traffic in that port. Although not part of the direct route, this company was launched to build a cable between Marseille, Bona in Algeria and Malta. It was built on, at the request of the French government because Bender, Pender thought it would assist him in obtaining the landline concession. However, the concession was awarded to Philip Arthur Stanhope, who had only acquired it to sell it to the highest bidder. Pender blocked Stanhope's attempts to sell the fine, sell this, and he finally purchased it from him in October 1876 at the cost of £100,000. Once the system to India was operating successfully, Pender merged these four companies to form the Eastern Telegraph Company. The shore end was landed at Porth Kernow by the investigator on the 6th of June 1870, and the final splice was completed two days later. John Pender was in the cable hut on the beach at Porth Kernow to witness the first telegraph messages sent over his cable to Bombay. Both scenes were captured by the artist Robert Dudley, who presented them to Panda shortly afterwards. They remained among his most treasured possessions until his death. To celebrate the event, a soiree was held at John Pender's London home, 18 Arlington Street. The guest of honour was Albert Edward Prince of Wales, and Cromwell Varley demonstrated modern telegraph techniques. Guests were invited to send messages to Bombay, Calcutta and New York, receiving replies within 15 minutes. Over the next 25 years, Pender used a similar business model to build his global network. In each case, the supply contract was given to Telcon, except where there were strategic reasons not to do so. In most of these cases, Telcom was given the, the main contract and he had subcontracted the work to other suppliers. So let us look quickly at the major routes that Pender built. Unsurprisingly, in parallel with the cable to India, Pender set about onward connection to Australasia and China, the other centre of his Calico export business. This part of Pender's network was built in competition with the Platino Brasilio Company, which had been formed with Brazilian investment, but it had stalled and was liquidated in 1877. It was reformed as a London-based company with new British backers, and it came under Pender's control the following year. The building of this part of the network involved British government investment for the first time since the failed 1858 cable across the Atlantic. The extensions from Zanzibar to Seychelles and Mauritius were added in, 19, in 1892 when Zanzibar became a British protectorate. Africa Direct was formed after Pender won a British government tender. It laid and operated the cables from St Vincent to Lagos and Bonny. The West Africa Company was originally a joint venture with Telcom. 
In, 18, in June 1887, Penda bought out Telcom's remaining equity and raised a further £200,000 to lay a cable from Nigeria to Cape Town. This was completed in early 1889. The West Coast Company was formed in 1875 by the India Rubber Gutter Percha Company to lay cables between Valparaiso and Lima, but got into financial difficulty and was saved from bankruptcy when John Pender purchased it in 1877. The Pacific and Euro European negotiated rights laid and operated a terrestrial telegraph from Buenos Aires to Valparaiso. This allowed Pender to provide telegraph services from London to Lima by 1893. It was the last major network development in which John Pender took the leading role. These systems were lucrative, but more importantly, they controlled business, government and military communications. This gave Pender incredible power and influence, and inevitably attracted competition, especially on the major routes. At the outset, these two companies worked together setting prices, sharing revenues and providing mutual restoration in an arrangement called a joint purse agreement. They enjoyed monopoly con control for the next three years. The first competitive cable across the Atlantic was built by this company founded by Frederick Emil Baron de Langer and Paul Julius von Reuter. In 1873, the Anglo-American 1866 cable had failed, so the British partnership was vulnerable. Pender's solution was to merge these two companies, raise new capital and buy out the French company. Launched by Seaman Brothers, the direct cable went into service in 1874 and began taking customers away from Anglo-American. Pender became, began buying up shares and promoting what he called a friendly alliance, but things became hostile. One of the shareholders of the direct was Henri Dupre Le Boucherer, who was also proprietor of the Truth magazine, in which he attacked John Pender, dubbing him the Cable King. Le Boucherer meant this to imply that Pender was a draconian dictator. But this misfired, and it would later become an epithet of respect and endearment. Eventually, the case went to court, and Pender versus Lushington, who was chairman of the director at that time, has gone down as a milestone case in British business law. Pender prevailed, and the direct came under his control. He became chairman of the restructured company in 1877, and it then joined the joint purse agreement. This company was founded by Augustine Thomas Poyer Kitier, I've got the pronunciation right there, and became known as the PQ Company. Its cable went into service in 1880, and Pender was able to prevail upon Kitier to join the joint purse agreement that same year. This company was founded by the American tycoon Jason J. Gould. And during a visit to New York in 1882, Pender was able to persuade him to join the joint purse agreement. By then, Gould owned Western Union, to which he used his cables. While in New York, Pender had a meeting with James Gordon Bennett, proprietor of the New York Herald. Bennett wanted a preferential rate for the paper's traffic, large traffic volume. Failed to reach an agreement with Bennett would come back to Hornpender because Bennett formed the commercial cable company with John W. Mackay to compete with the joint purse companies. Their cables went into service in 1885 and had an immediate impact on Pender's revenues. In 1886, Mackay was invited to join the joint purse agreement but declined to do so, and so a crippling price war ensued. This was not resolved until September 1888, when the commercial cable company joined the joint purse agreement, and Pender regained control over the pricing of transatlantic telegraphy. 
This was an arena that he would not have to enter again during his lifetime. Almost as soon as Panda set up his services to Australasia, the colonial governments began looking for alternatives. In January 1877, they met behind closed doors to consider the possible benefits of a cable between New Zealand and San Francisco. This was followed in August by a confidential report which found its way into John Pender's hands. Fortunately for him, although the colonial government found the concept attractive, they were not prepared to authorise any funding. The railway from the Atlantic coast to British Columbia would have telegraph lines running alongside the track, and although it would not be complete until 1885, the company's chief engineer began promoting the concept of a Pacific cable from British Columbia, so that there was an all-British controlled route across the Atlantic and Pacific. This was a much more compelling proposal, but Pender was still able to use the influence and control of the Eastern Group to discourage investment in such a project. Fleming and the promoters of the Pacific Cable to con continued to lobby for the next few years, making little progress, until the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, who was John Pender's next door neighbour, agreed to host a colonial conference in London to coincide with Queen Victoria's Jubilee, Silver Jubilee. Pender knew that the Pacific Cable would be high on the agenda, but he was not allowed to take part in the deliberations, so he could only lobby delegates in the halls and dining rooms of the conference centre. Prior to the conference, he began a concentrating cam campaign of lobbying key members of Salisbury's government and officials of the colonial office. Pender and Fleming were both invited to present their cases to conference. Finally, John Pender hosted a dinner for all the delegates, and Emma entertained the delegates' wives with a musical evening at Arlington Street. The outcome of the conference was that the Pacific Cable was seen to be desirable, but neither the British government nor the colonial governments were prepared to fund it. The debate raged on, but no government money was forthcoming. However, the Royal Navy did survey a cable route, including a landing at Johnson Island in the Hawaiian chain, which they tried to take possession of as a British territory. This caused a di diplomatic row with the United States of America, but before it could be resolved, the Kingdom of Hawaii was overthrown and became a republic annexed to the USA. Without an Hawaiian landing, the span from Fiji to British Columbia was too long, so the promotion of the Pacific Cable stalled once again. The promoters of the Pacific Cable came up with alternative routings and the subject was again top of the agenda of the next colonial conference. By now, Pender had accepted that the Pacific Cable would eventually go ahead, but he believed he could still put it off for a few more years. He did not travel to Ottawa, but did all he could to ensure that the British government sent a representative sympathetic to his cause. Once again, the conference supported the concept of the Pacific Cable but committed no financial support. Pender knew that unless there was strong support in Parliament for the project, it would, de it would be deferred until the next colonial conference. So he set about influencing the most powerful businessmen and politicians with a brilliant but outrageous PR campaign dubbed the Silver Jubilee of the Establishment of Submarine Cable to the Far East. This, of course, was a pretext to demonstrate the power and influence of the Eastern Telegraph Group. The central plank of this campaign was a lavish banquet, fete and exhibition held at the Imperial Institute here in South Kensington. Once again, Pender achieved his objective and the question of the Pacific Cable was deferred. John Pender was able to fight off the threat of the Pacific Cable <coughs> for almost 20 years, and it was not until six years after his death that it was finally built. <coughs> In the 1888 New Year's Honours List, 
John Pender was finally recognised by the establishment when he was knighted. This honour had been sponsored by his next door neighbour, Lord Salisbury. The Eastern Telegraph Company organised a banquet in his honour, which took place in the Metropole Hotel in London on the 23rd of April, when 220 guests sat down to dinner. The organising committee arranged for a portrait of John Pender to be painted and presented to Emma with a copy for her to present to the company. The commission was awarded to Herbert von Herkimer and the original was presented to Sir John Pender at the banquet when he guaranteed that Emma would be very happy with it. After the banquet, the portrait was displayed in the spring exhibition of the Royal Society of Art. Emma saw it for the first time when the copy was delivered to Arlington Street. She was not impressed. And she wrote to Herkimer, expressing her disappointment. Recognising the, Pender, the Pender's influence in the arts and the risk to his reputation, Herkimer agreed to paint a replacement at no additional fee. It was delivered to Emma in January 1890, and she was much happier with his second version. When it was returned from the exhibition, the original painting was consigned to the cellar at Arlington Street. The second portrait hung in Arlington Street until John Pender's death, after which it was donated to the Eastern Telegraph Company and hung in the company's boardroom throughout the 20th century. It is now in the Telegraph Museum at Porthcurno. The original portrait was donated to Wick in 1899 and now hangs in the town hall. Both Emma and John were great lovers of art and when they set up their residence in Arlington Street they became patrons of the Royal Academy and Bradbury and Agnew from where they purchased most of their paintings. One of the first London commissions was a painting of their daughters by Millet. It hung over the fireplace in the dining room at Arlington Street until John Pender's death, when it was passed down through the family until it was sold to the Detroit Institute of Arts, where it can be seen today. From 1872 to her death in 1890, Emma hosted a dinner party for the artists prior to the Royal Academy Spring Exhibition. This started as a single event, but grew into dinners on three consecutive evenings. When guests would be in, include writers, academics and politicians. They were so popular that the queues of carriages would tail back into Piccadilly and it would take over an hour for a coach to reach the house. In 1894, Pender commissioned Bradbury and Agnew to, to catalogue his major items in his art collection. The catalogue listed 412 separate items, 271 oil paintings, 126 watercolours and 15 sculptures. After his death, this collection was sold by Christie's at auction, scheduled for two days such was the interest that it took eight days for all the lots to pass under the hammer. After the Ottawa Conference and the success of the PR campaign to delay the Pacific Cable, John Pender decided at the age of 76 it was time to take a back seat and leave the day-to-day -day running of the Eastern Group to his son John. Just prior to his mother's death, John Pender had taken John Denison Pender had taken by royal warrant his mother's maiden name as a second surname, and he became John Denison Denison Pender. An extravagant banquet was held in John Pender's honour and took place at the Metropole Hotel on the 16th of November. After many speeches and toast, Pender was presented with two lavish gifts. The first was an illuminated scroll signed by the 20 members of the organising committee in a silver casket. The second was a massive 42 kilogram solid silver trophy 
but an embossed portrait of Sir John Pender on the front. The scroll is still part of the family archive. The trophy is now owned by an Iranian jeweller, but the whereabouts of the scroll casket is unknown. After the banquet, Pender decided that it was time to end his political career. As already discussed, John Pender's political career began in Totnes in 1862. He stood for election on ten separate occasions and was MP for Wicksburg between 1872 and 1885. He was a liberal by inclination, but fell out with Gladstone over home rule to Ireland and Gladstone's desire to nationalise his companies. He was also a prime mover in the formation of the breakaway Liberal Unionists. Although he never made a significant speech in the House or held any high political office, for 30 years he was influential in the corridors of power under both Liberal and Conservative governments. A year after his death, his wife's death, Joseph Chamberlain persuaded Pender to contest his old seat of Wicks Burr at the next general election. He regained his seat, but due to his declining health, found the journey to the far north of Scotland too arduous and decided that he would not defend the seat at the next election. The next general election took place in the summer of 1895. The leaders of the Liberal Unionists, Joseph Chamberlain and the Duke of Devonshire, knew that it would be a close run thing but they felt confident of holding Wicksburg if Pender stood. And a series of meetings were held when Pender agreed to stand again on the understanding that whether he won or lost, he would be granted a hereditary peerage. Okay. Having won the seat, he thought all he had to do was wait until the New Year's Honours list, accept his peerage and make his life complete. Apart from his knighthood, John Pender received recognition from all over the world of his massive contribution to business in general and Sunbury telegraphy in particular. In 1892, at the behest of Lord Salisbury, his KCMG was raised to GCMG, but the promised barony never materialised. In December 1895, John Pender suffered a severe stroke and his name was absent from the 1896 New Year's Honours list. Why this should have been the case is unclear, but two theories exist. The first is that Chamberlain and the Duke of Devonshire did not have the influence in Salisbury's government to deliver what they had promised, and that Pender's stroke was brought on by the knowledge that his hopes had been dashed. The second is that Lord Salisbury had the warrant ready for Queen Victoria to sign, but withdrew it after Pender's stroke, as the prognosis was that he would never survive. This second story is the one that has been passed down through the Dennis and Pender family. In 1863, John Pender took a 15-year lease on 18 Arlington Street, and when the lease expired, he and Emma purchased the property. It was a unique Georgian house built in the Gothic style and stood behind a gatehouse. In 1894, he had a set of photographs of the house taken. The house was demolished in 1934 to make way for luxury apartments, which are still there today. The gatehouse was demolished, wasn't demolished until the 1950s. Crumsall had been the family residence since 1856. And in 1873, John Pender sold it and made Arlington Street his main residence. He bought Menard Castle on Lock Fine in 1866, and the family spent their summers there. He sold the estate in 1875, and it is the only one of his residences still standing today. In 1876, Pender took out a 21-year lease on Footscray Place, owned by the Van Sittar family. Built in 1754, 
It was one of the only, only four Palladian style mansions in the United Kingdom. It was destroyed by fire in 1949. After his stroke, against all expectations, John Pender rallied. However, he was never able to work again. And in May 1896, his son James, then MP for Northampton, stood up in the House of Commons and announced that his father would never take his seat again. In July, he suffered another stroke, a massive stroke, and died at Footscray Place with all his family around him. The funeral took place at All Saints Church, Footscray, on the 17th of July. The service was conducted by the local vicar, Charles Birch, and the Dean of Westminster, George Bradley. Over 250 mourners packed the tiny church and surrounding graveyard when John Pender was laid to rest in the family vault. When John Pender's son, Henry, died, he was the first Pender to be buried at All Saints Graveyard. He was buried in a simple grave, but it had a five metre granite Celtic cross set on top of it. Henry had been an accomplished organist, and the Penders donated an organ to the church in his memory. It is still there today. Emma's dying wish was that she would be buried alongside her son, and so John Pender had a family board constructed with the Celtic cross on top, standing on a granite frostrum. Shortly after John's death, the graveyard was expanded and the trees around the tomb were felled. When Anne died in 1902, she was buried in the family vault and her name was added to the frustrum. The Celtic cross was blown down and broken in the great storm of 1987, but thanks to Cable and Wallace it was repaired in 1993 and is still there today. It is the only lasting memorial to the life of Sir John Pender accessible to the public. After John Pender's death, a memorial committee was formed with the lofty ambition of creating a national monument to the great man. £6,277 was raised and 5000 was used to set up and endow a new electrical engineering laboratory to University College London. This was to be called the Pender Laboratory and the chair of the Electrical Engineering Department was also to be renamed the Pender Chair. The first person to be appointed to the Pender Chair was Sir John Ambrose Fleming in 1897. The Pender Laboratory was officially opened by John Dennis and Pender in 1902. The remainder of the fund was used to com commission a marble bust. The sculptor chosen was Edward Onslow Ford, and the work was completed in 1897. The, first, the bust was exhibited in the Corporation of Manchester Art Gallery the following year, before being put on permanent display at UCL when John Dennis and Pender officially opened the Pender Laboratory. It remained there for over a hundred years, but is now in the possession of the Denison Pender family and no longer on public display. In 1922, as part of its gold, Golden Jubilee celebration, the Eastern Telegraph Group's in-house magazine reflected the story of John Pender's inexhaustible tenacity and courage as he, and his enduring faith in the face of recurring adversity is an inspiration to all, and it is typical of the finest British instincts. There is little doubt that it was this, these characteristics, combined with his understanding of the importance of telecommunications, that enabled him to build his global submarine network. However, today very few people have heard of him, or are aware of the debt that the world owes him for the immense legacy he has left us. There is much more to the life of the, this remarkable man, but I have, hope I have given you some insight into his main, many achievements. If I have whetted your appetite to find out more about Sir John, 
then you may be interested in my bi biography of him that has been recently published. Thank you very much. That's been a fascinating insight in someone that not many of us know about his positive contribution to both telegraphy and also his contribution to the arts. And, you know, interesting, the Pender Chair and the Pender Laboratory, which I think is fascinating to us all. Um, there's a bit of time for questions, so if you're happy to take a few... His will dictated that all his assets should be sold off and that funds set up for his children. Oh, as simple as that. Uh, and in fact, many of the paintings were repurchased by family members. <laughs> so they went through the process of doing what he asked. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a situation of... He didn't he, need... He, he, he didn't, he didn't, yeah, it wasn't no, a situation he, of death duties or anything like that. No, he was a very rich man and um, he was very clever in the last ten years of his life to move things around and you might say creative accounting to make sure that the government didn't get as much as they should have done. <laughs> so even though his children weren't going to inherit more money, he still wanted to sell it and to sell it and all. He thought the only fair way um, to do it was to sell off the assets to share money evenly across the board. Uh, all the, the one thing that is, is clear is that all the family portraits and sculptures were not sold. So the ones that were of his son or his, his grandsons or his, his daughters weren't sold. And I've got another question. The, through those, the, the 1860s, when he was building up those telegraph companies everywhere, and I'm sure this is in your book, but how did he set up the logistics of that? You know, I mean, because you didn't have aeroplanes in those days. You couldn't sort of fly to Aden and suddenly set it all up and, you know. No, he, he travelled. Did, did he travel? Yeah. Yeah, he travelled the globe, and um, I think you find th these things took a long time. Yeah. And his wife, his wife wrote a series of letters, which you know you have the volumes of. Um, and the time it took letters to get to these places was just, was just incredible. Uh, his daughter, who married uh, William Devoe, went to William Devoe became the governor of Fiji. And letters between Fiji and England took over six weeks on a, on a good day, well, on, a, on a good route. So they, they were working sort of three months apart. In, um, and his wife said in one of the letters that the trouble with this is that you, know, you wait for ages for good news and as soon as you get a letter, you want more. Because it's obviously raised um, issues that you want to get. Um, you want the answers to you immediately, and of course it doesn't happen. But of course that was one of the reasons why the telegraph was, was so important. But mainly for business, because it was so expensive that there was no social media in those days. The only people that could afford telegraph were business, governments, and the military. What happened to his textile company? Uh, he finally closed it down in uh, 1879. So he extracted himself slowly from that business and in fact he effectively got out of the peak because it became more and more competitive and more and more difficult so he was a very shrewd businessman sorry Julia thank you that was actually quite a story um, I just wanted to pick up on the calico business because you said somewhere in the middle about going out to India and he was laying the cable and you know in the calico business I mean we see he wasn't laying cables influenced by the places he was exporting the calico to. I mean, is there... You might think that. I couldn't possibly tell many. <laughs> but of course, but, of course he did in yeah. the beginning. He's, he's still, at the time he built those cables, he had a thriving export business to India and China. Yeah. So the first place he connected was the places he wanted to get information about his business. But that's okay. I mean, that's quite... I mean, that's a fairly brilliant thing to do. So that, in fact, the calico business, even though he eventually did a sort of right-handed turn and left it, was of some considerable influence 
to the laying of the cables. Oh yeah, and, and it produced the capital that allowed him to make, uh, I mean, I mentioned there that in order to form Telcon, he um, put up a personal guarantee of a quarter of a million pounds. God, and that's man, about mate. 14 million today. Mm. So he put that up, just saying, look guys, this is a good idea. We'll put these companies together and we'll, we'll make a lot of money. Mm. You don't believe me, I'll guarantee a quarter of a million for you. Now, that's incredible. Mm. Yes, no, it absolutely is. Mm. And do be sorry, because since I've got the microphone, can I go on? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, did he also, I mean, so he's running these businesses, was he also setting up, you know, the machinery, the factories, the etc., actually to, to produce the cables? Where, where did all that come in? Because you're talking about his sort of business practices, but he, there must have been a whole layer underneath. Oh, yeah, he, he wasn't an engineer. No. Uh, so technically, he was a steward, but he, he didn't, in that sense, he didn't get his hands dirty. If you go right back to the beginning, he was an artist and became a pattern maker, which was a very skilled job, and mm -hmm. for artisans, it was highly paid. Mm. But he moved from that into business management, and, and that's, he could see opportunities in all sorts of things. I haven't mentioned he was involved in mining, um, both in South America and, and in the UK. He therefore went and visited places in Bristol that were making diamond bit drills for, for mining. Because every business that he entered, he wanted to know how it worked in the tiniest of detail. He actually produced a book of statistics in the 1860s, which showed the statistics he'd been collecting since he started business, basically, from 1840 onwards. That's actually fascinating. Sorry, else. Good to meet you. The cost of using these cables, you're saying that companies could do it. Any idea of the actual costs that were involved in, in using the cables? Um, if you're talking about a uh, telegram in 1876 to New Zealand, you would be paying 10 shillings a word. In 1876 values. So it was very expensive. The only place where the, the rates came down, I did talk about the price war across the Atlantic. Atlantic. Um, the competitive pricing during um, what I called the, um, the price war that uh, they really tried to drive one another out of the market. Um, they were charging 12 cents, American cents, which I guess a dollar then was probably, what, four, five to the pound? Yeah. Yeah. So 12 cents a word was the price, but they weren't making money at that. As soon as Panda got them to come to heel and he re-established the um, control over pricing, it doubled and it went back up to 25 cents a word. So where there was volume, the prices were lower. Where there were, I mean, to Australia, there were something like a dozen telegrams a day being sent over the road, no more. And so the pricing had to reflect the, the cost of operating the system. And that's why he was so bent on defending his position. He'd invested millions of his own and his partner's money in building this cable. And as soon as it was there, everybody wanted something cheaper and started promoting competition. So he spent the last part of his life fighting off um, not only Gladstone, who wanted to private, uh, take his private companies and make them public, but competition that would uh, undermine his business. Yeah, um, there was mention of a military aspect of, of use of the cables. Was that a significant part of it? Because if, oh, yes. if, if you go on down communications, you know, there's a theory that Marconi's only possible customer was the British Admiralty and the web comes from APRANET, which was a US military thing. Yeah. So the... I, I think you have to remember that most of the cables that he built connected British territories, so the Empire. Mm. And of course we controlled the Empire by the military. And so information about moving uh, units around and getting them to places of insurrection very quickly Telegraph made a major, major difference. 
There's a, there is a story that one of the things, one of the telegrams that got across the 1858 cable was to send information to London to some armed forces, I can't remember the exact details, in the USA telling them to ignore the, the original order to come home and say, uh, stay there because they weren't needed at, at the next um, event. And that apparently saved the, the government £200,000. So, these things help. There are a lot of anecdotal stories like that. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious about the um, uh, little bit following on from what Julia was asking about the, um, the manufacturer, how that was handled. Was it a number of companies doing it and also the installation in terms of the contracting? I mean, I appreciate, as you say, it was like a business level, but how did they handle that to, to facilitate it? Um. Throughout the Victorian era, the only manufacturers of submarine cables were British companies. And virtually all of them from 1870 onwards were on the Thames. Uh, Telcon was the dominant one, basically, because they were fed all the contracts from Bender. So, um, but remember, he, he was a major shareholder in that company. And when Daniel Gooch took over him from him, when Gooch died, Penda didn't have the influence because they were very close friends and he deliberately didn't get, sit on the board of the two companies to, to avoid the accusation that he was manipulating the market. So when Gooch died, his son James, who I haven't talked about a lot, um, took over from him as a, as a director of Telcon. And so he, was, he also had his finger in the manufacturing point. And in terms of cable ships, the, the companies that manufactured the cable owned the cable ships that laid the cables. And the companies that operated the, the systems owned the cable ships that repaired the ships, nobody repaired the cables. Basically, repair ships sit in locations around the world on 24 hour call, call out to go and repair a cable if it goes down. Particularly today, I mean, the, the amount of traffic on a submarine cable is phenomenal. And of course, all the time it's down, and, you, and if you can't send it over another road, then you're losing money. And it's that same cable still today? It's the same style. I mean, now, now, nowadays it's obviously fibre optic cable as opposed to telegraph, and we're talking about terabits of data as opposed to 12 words routes. a minute. And it's the same routes because it's geography and politics. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I believe I'll host here at the Science Museum. And for anybody interested in the history of cable, the Information Age Gallery at the Science Museum is a tremendous resource uh, to which John Penn has major contributions. And you can see chronologically how the cable industry developed and how important his part in it was and how important the cable industry remains, as Stuart says today. I think you'd agree with that, Stuart? I think I would, yeah. I mean, I remember I started my presentation by saying that um, today we have almost instant access to information uh, through our laptops, mobile phones. Uh, tablets and uh, personal computers and that's because there's an array of submarine cables around the world. Uh, they are fibre optic cables now to carrying significantly more information but I think you've got to remember that the change to the Victorians was phenomenal. I, in many of these presentations I talk about when the, the first telegraph was invented, Charles Dickens is said to have said, the world changed forever once information travelled faster than a man on a horse. And I think that was the seismic change to the world when these telegraph cables started connecting. You know, a business agreement between the, the US and the UK would take six to eight weeks to put together because information going backwards and forwards, even with steamships, it would be a fortnight travelling could be done in an hour over a telegraph system. So, yeah, the, the financial model of the world changed. I was intrigued by the picture you showed of the trophy given to Penda and the dimensions, 138 centimetres. Was it really that big? Yeah. Four feet by four feet by 
I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it, it was huge. Thank you. 40, for... 42 kilograms. Mm. Thank you for confirming it. Yeah. <laughs> I can uh, confirm the dimensions on the trophy. Um, yeah, I have a website on Atlantic Cabling's history, and a few years ago I got an email from somebody in uh, um, from the Iran. And the gentleman said, I've seen the story of the trophy on your page. We have the original trophy. And I was just amazed that it had not been melted down uh, in the uh, 100 years since it was created. And they sent me photographs and the dimensions and confirmed the weight. And it really is that huge piece of silver. I mean, it's actually, that's not uncommon. It might have been particularly large. But, I mean... Many of the great engineers were given enormous chunks of silver, in, you know, and obviously somebody like Pender, that presentation it would be an a, you know, it would be a, a central table setting, yeah. or something like that. I mean, it isn't. It's it might be bigger and grander, but it's certainly not uncommon, and certainly all the railway engineers. I mean, Robert Stevenson was presented with enormous chunks of silver when when the London and Birmingham was completed. So it's a sort of common way of companies to recognise the, you know, the genius the person that's doing all the work, so to speak. I agree with that era. I mean, it wouldn't happen today. <laughs> no. And I was interested by your point about Herkoma, because Herkoma painted my great-great-grandfather, and it was a sort of enormous, clumsy painting, you know, five feet tall, with, with a head, an enormous amount of body dressed in black, and my father had it cut down. <laughs> I think, on the whole, quite rightly. <laughs> okay, if there are uh, one more question. No, it's oh. an announcement okay. about the, uh, the summer trip. All right, well, uh, perhaps just before we start on the announcement, perhaps just thank Stuart again for that fascinating and intriguing talk. And then, there, as Fred said, there's a few announcements perhaps we'll make at the end. So if people like to... Thanks to you first of all.